All right, hello, friends, or should I say, hello, friends, get on your knees, go. <laughs> Ooh, that hurts. <laughs> I don't know how people do that. What up, crab core warriors and RAR XD scene kids everywhere? Hello, friends. Yes, welcome back. I hope you're doing well. It's me, your friendly neighborhood cozy representative, back again with yet another uh, awesome scene kid deep dive. Oh, man. Are y'all ready? Because today we're straightening our scene fringe. We're getting down low. We're jogging in place for some reason, and we're getting heavy, y'all. <laughs> this isn't over, baby. I'm the cozy representative. We're also, uh, for the first time ever on this channel, I believe, uh, traveling across the pond to enjoy some tea and crumpets in sunny old England, mate. Uh, I believe this is the first non-American band that I've covered, which has me very excited. They're from England, if you couldn't uh, pick up on my bad humor and bad English accent. Now, just to uh, preface the rest of this video, the band we're going to be talking about today moved to America from England in 2008 with basically no money or no musical clout to their name, no audience. They moved over here to start their band with nothing but just the dream of taking over the world and being rock stars, man. They were a metalcore band. Um, they were also on the forefront of the electronic core wave, the electronic metalcore genre, if you will. <laughs> Which at that point in time, at around 2008, you had a new wave, a new style of metalcore, and this birthing of electronic core, uh, which began dominating the Warped Tour scene in America and all across the world around that time, spearheaded by bands like Bring Me the Horizon, The Devil Wears Prada, Parkway Drive, and of course, how could we forget the ever-polarizing metalcore darlings, Attack Attack, who coined the term crab core because they would do like poop squats down low while playing their songs on stage. <laughs> <laughs> This wave of bands, which now looking back, this genre is commonly either referred to as Crabcore or Risecore, because most of these bands were on the label Rise Records, were most commonly known for combining heavy metalcore chugs and s hardcore screaming uh, with catchy synthesizer parts, dance breaks, and catchy clean vocals with often auto-tuned, very poppy choruses, either like influenced by literal Top 40 pop or uh, simply just verging into pop-punk territory with the melodies. All of these different aspects being added onto metalcore uh, had never really been done in the world of metalcore or post-hardcore before around this era, and while it was making huge waves in the scene, kids everywhere were loving it, it was without a doubt extremely polarizing, as y'all know, and attracted hordes and hordes of haters. Uh, plenty of people thought this music was just absolutely ridiculous and bad and horrible, and back in 2010, um, a lot of times simply saying the phrase attack attack are a good band uh, was a blasphemous statement in most circles. Now this rants on a shit-tacular fucking band known as Asking Alexandria. First of all, what the kind of name is Asking Alexandria? Really? That's not metal. Funny, considering the tables have pretty much completely turned, and nowadays pretty much all of these metalcore bands from this time are revered and considered extremely influential and ultimately great. <laughs> and this wave of crabcore, electronic-styled metalcore bands, uh, which began picking up major steam in 08 and 09, heavily inspired and influenced the sound and musical style of the little band from England that we're going to be talking about today. Our English scene kings, our cowboy kings, if you will, took the sounds laid down by Attack Attack and Bring Me the Horizon and those kind of bands, beefed it up, took it to the the next level and created 
a metalcore masterpiece in 2009, which was their first record, uh, which absolutely blew the F up worldwide, and within, like, less than a year, the band was pretty much a household name in the world of Warped Tour metalcore, uh, which was absolutely huge around 2010 or so. And this band, I mean, they were, like, literally gigantic. They got really huge quick. I mean, they were the kind of band that, like, preppy popular girls at my school, like, knew about them for some reason. They were huge. <laughs> and after they got huge, you know, this band was extremely influenced by the lifestyle of, like, 80s hair metal bands, uh, which was an interesting aspect that we're going to get plenty into later. Um, they took the teachings of Motley Crue and all those 80s glam bands to heart and basically lived the rock and roll excessive part lifestyle in their early days as a band to the max, to the extreme, indulging in all the copious amounts of hard alcohol that their livers could possibly handle, as well as all of the powdery white substances their nasal passages could possibly handle. Uh, as you could imagine, this lifestyle caused a plethora of problems for this band. They've had their ups and their downs. There are a million crazy stories about this band and in these videos, we're going to go over all of it. However, in this video, the part one, uh, we're going to be pretty much going over the early days of this band, their formation, their moving to America, their blowing up, and all that. So, my friends, without further ado, once again, I am the Cozy Representative. Oh, real quick, before we get into the nitty gritty, I never usually do this, but I just want to say real quick, if you like my channel, if you like these videos that I make and you want to support me further, I do have merch uh, that you can pick up in the link in the description off of my Teespring account. I got t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, all types of stuff. Check it out. Um, I am also on Patreon where I have tons of bonus content. Um, the link is also in the description. If you want to help me out further and support me in my channel, I would greatly appreciate it so I can continue uh, making these videos for all of you wonderful people. But if not, it's totally cool. Don't worry about it. Let's just get on to today's video. <laughs> this, my friends, is the wild rise of Asking Alexandria, Warp Tour's hardest partying band, part one. Let's go. What is up? Now, before we get started on today's video, a quick word from today's sponsor, Ride or Die Clothing. Now, has this ever happened to you? You know, you wake up in the morning, you go to go get dressed for the day, and you have the realization that your t-shirt collection has absolutely no swag? Well, you're in luck, because I have got the perfect solution for you. Ride or Die Clothing, based out of California, has all types of amazing t-shirts, which are the shirts for you if you want to add some colorful neon swag to your closet today. I mean, just look at these shirts, man. You'll be looking like you're hopping out of a tour bus, about to take stage at the 2009 Warped tour with this kind of drip. Seriously, man, these shirts are so fresh. Check out this hoodie, man. I wear this hoodie all the time, ride or die. Doesn't it? It's so comfortable. Don't you want to be as comfortable as I am, as cozy as I am, as neon as I am? I know you want to. Frankie, who runs ride or die clothing, is a close personal friend of mine and I personally swear by his brand as well as just him as a human being. It's definitely stuff you should support. To check out Ride or Die Clothing online, which you should, uh, and you know, proceed to up your swag levels by at least 150%, check out Ride or Die online at Ride or Die Brand on Instagram. Ride or Die brand on Twitter. Go give them a follow. Get connected. Get involved. 
And if you want to actually purchase some of these awesome shirts, which you absolutely should, log on to rideordieclothing.net. That's rideordieclothing.net. Also, after you fill up your cart at rideordieclothing.net, before you check out, feel free to enter the promo code COZYREP. That's COZYREP, one word, all capitals. Uh, enter that promo code before you check out for 15 percent off off of your total order uh utilize this today that's a great deal promo code cozy rep before you check out enter that in for 15 percent off of your order on ride or die clothing as a special thank you from me and ride or die for checking out their clothes big thanks to frankie and everyone over at ride or die clothing for sponsoring today's video i appreciate it a ton go check them out and with that onwards to today's video Thanks, y'all. All right, so believe it or not, our story, interestingly, actually begins in Dubai in the early 2000s with a young man named Benjamin Paul Bruce. Ben, who was around 15 or 16 years old at the time, was originally born in England, but his family had moved to Dubai when he was about six years old due to his parents apparently not being satisfied with the English school system or something like that. Ben loved music a whole lot. Uh, when he was younger, he first got into pop punk bands bands like Blink-182 and Green Day before eventually discovering and falling in love with heavier metal bands like Metallica and Iron Maiden, which opened his eyes and ears up to more classic metal bands as well as newer metal core bands at the time like Avenged Sevenfold or As I Lay Dying and that sort of thing. He started playing guitar uh, when he was a preteen and that's when his dream of starting a metal core band and touring and taking over the world and living the rock star life began. Around Around this time when he was a teenager, he got together with some like-minded friends where he lived in Dubai and formed the original Asking Alexandria in the mid-2000s. Asking Alexandria consisted of Ben Bruce on guitar, obviously, but with all completely different other members than the Asking Alexandria that we know and love today. Different vocalist, different drummer, different everybody except for Ben Bruce. I do want to say it's kind of unclear uh, which exact year the original Dubai-based Asking Alexandria had formed. There is a bio on their old MySpace page, which I'm about to read from, which says that they formed all the way back in 2003, but on Wikipedia and pretty much everywhere else on the internet it says they formed in 06. Um, I don't know exactly which one is accurate, but let's just say it was somewhere in the mid-2000s when they formed. <laughs> now, uh, the following, as I stated, is a quote from the bio of their old MySpace page, screen grabbed in September of 2008. Firstly, this, what you're looking at right now, was their MySpace layout at the time. Pretty cool, pretty spiffy, I like it. Uh, now, their old MySpace bio uh, reads the following. Formed in 2003 in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, Asking Alexandria fused both melodic and hardcore style vocals with heavier, more hardcore musical elements. The band's first EP, Tomorrow Hope Goodbye, was self-released and brought the band a lot of interest and exposure from all over the world. Spots to open up for Boy Sets Fire, Pennywise, Jimmy Eat World, and countless other bands were soon offered to the band, as well as airplay on international radio station blah 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 whatever interviews um <laughs> gaining the band even more exposure leaving asking alexandria a force to be reckoned with amongst the local scene pretty interesting if i do say so myself i don't know i like looking at old myspace pages it's fun um now uh after their first ep release in 2006 the band released a full-length record in the following year of 2007 which was called the irony of your perfection now the music that the original dubai-based asking alexandria 
industry was making at this time was very mid-2000s metalcore slash post-hardcore inspired, I guess. Um, very comparable to bands at the time like As I Lay Dying or All That Remains or Trivium. Uh, you know, all of the popular metalcore power players in the mid-2000s before Crabcore and Risecore came into the picture. The OG Asking Alexandria played a lot of local shows around Dubai uh, and toured around the UK area, I believe, and also started building up hype and buzz on the internet, on MySpace, as most bands did at the time. Once 2008 had rolled around, Ben Bruce had decided that it was time for him to uh, move away from Dubai and return to his home of England. Uh, according to him, it was because he simply missed home and, you know, wanted to move back. He was born he in England, he's British, he just wanted to go back home, and there would also be far more musical opportunities uh, for the band in England, more of a flourishing rock and metal scene there as opposed to Dubai, uh, and actually all of those original members did go with Ben at first to the UK in order to pursue the band, but apparently as the story goes, all the other members basically just quit the band after about a month. You see, around this time, Ben wanted to take the band really seriously and basically devote everything to it. You know, he wanted to tour and, you know, not work a regular job, just go full throttle on this band and, and really reach that next level and make the dream of, of playing music for a living happen. He was very serious about it and seemingly the other members of the original band weren't willing to make that kind of huge sacrifice for what could be viewed by some rational adults as a pipe dream. The other members were just like, this is too expensive, this is too hard, they probably had real jobs jobs and weren't willing to eat ramen noodles in a van like Ben Bruce was. So, the original Asking Alexandria sadly split up, I believe in 2008, leaving Ben in the dust shortly after he moved back to England. And this, my friends, is where our story really begins. <laughs> so at this time with Ben back in England in 2008, he decided it was time to form a new band consisting of new people who shared Ben's dreams and goals of making it in a successful band. The first person that Ben contacted was a young 17 year old kid who Ben had formed a friendship, a relationship with over the internet. Although this kid was from the small village of Gilbertike, which is a tiny village in Yorkshire, England. Although he was from this small town, he was infamously known on MySpace at the time as, get this, Danny Epidemic. <laughs> yup, that's right. Although he would eventually drop the uh, edgy MySpace moniker and go by his legal government name, Danny Warsnop, back in the day before the modern day AA forms, he went by Danny Epidemic. And yup, he looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> yep, all these pictures that you're seeing right now, that's Danny. Obviously, if you know what he's ended up looking like throughout the years and what he looks like nowadays, it's pretty hard to believe that this was uh, even him at one point, but it was. All these photos we're seeing right now were of Danny. You know, nowadays we have all these e-boys and e-girls on TikTok and whatnot doing their thing, but back in, back in my day in 07, we had characters like Danny Epidemic running around on MySpace paving the way. <laughs> so you're welcome. Now, just to dig a little deeper on who this Danny Epidemic epidemic scene queen was at the time, I happened to stumble across Danny's very first YouTube account, uh, which he had around this time in 07 or 08 or so, the account name being Warshnop, um, and this YouTube account is indeed still active and these videos are still up to this day, you can go check them out. Real quick, um, here's a segment of kind of now an infamous video of a very young Danny uh, jamming improv style with a friend of his playing random metalcore riffs and screaming and jumping around what I can only assume was one of their parents' houses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
uh, a video recorded on a very crappy 2007 cell phone. The video is called I Shouldn't Drink, which features a very inebriated young Danny walking around with his friend at nighttime, uh, and Danny is very drunk and telling her about a concoction that he created the night before called Happy Vodka. It's like what? Like, vodka and whatever fruit juices you can find at the time, and then you just mix them together, like, as strong as you can make it, without ruining flip, and then it makes you all happy, <laughs> so it's called Happy Vodka, I invented it last night, when I was drinking with Kenny, he's Scottish! <laughs> So he liked to drink even back then. Uh, Danny, if you look at these videos, he's pretty similar to, you know, how he ended up being in adulthood. He's just a scene queen at this time. There's also a video uh, called Round Town, where he's literally just walking around town with his friends. Fuck! You nearly got my fucking legs run over, you little bitch! Oh, you're a cunt. I hate... Oh, brutal hat. I was brutal last night for webcam. Like Brr, yeah, I was, I was on webcam last night. I don't know, I thought these were interesting. I wanted to put these in the video to show, you know, what kind of dude this guy was at the time. So, you get the picture. Danny was a teenage kid, uh, a MySpace king, obviously, you know, seemingly very into metalcore and heavy, screamy music. And even back then, the dude loved to drink, so there you go. So, legend has it, Ben and Danny formed up a friendship just over the internet, uh, just through being seen kids on MySpace in Europe, I'm presuming. Uh, and once Ben moved to England and the OG Asking Alexandria broke up, Ben and Danny actually ended up moving into an apartment together in a city in England called York. It was then that the two boys grew extremely close as friends quickly bonded over their love for heavy metal music and hard alcohol consumption and decided that they would start a new band together and began recording demos on a MacBook. As the story goes, Ben obviously played guitar, but Danny was actually originally going to be uh, the guitar player as well. They recorded a demo for a song instrumentally that Ben had written, um, and Ben had also written some lyrics for it, but since they had no official vocalist at the time, it was just Ben and Danny recording demos, Danny decided to get on the mic and give it a whirl uh, just for the sake of finishing the demo, I guess. He laid down vocals, and although they were a bit rough around the edges at first, Danny showed surprisingly a lot of potential as a vocalist, which neither of them were expecting, and the first song, uh, legend has it, that Danny recorded vocals for, uh, this early demo that Danny and Ben had created, was entitled The Final Episode. Let's change the channel. Let's hear that demo right now. Oh. The boys didn't know it then, but they were already making history, and gold records, TV appearances, and general scene stardom was soon to come their way, but they had to put the rest of the band together first. So the basic story of how Danny and Ben came across the rest of the members is pretty typical for how it is for most bands. All the other members played in other local bands in the area at the time, and Danny and Ben basically recruited everyone who they thought would be a good fit for their new band from those other local bands. I will let Mr. Ben Bruce himself go into greater detail on that one, though. Basically, um, I moved in with Danny in York, and uh... What happened? We were writing, just writing songs together, just the two of us on a, on your Mac and everything. And I uh, decided it might be a good idea to get other people to play instruments. Mm -hmm. And um, he knew uh, Cam and uh, Sam from like college and from other bands and stuff. And uh, the first member, other than myself and Danny, to be recruited was actually James. I went to a local show and saw him playing and I actually nicked him from a local band. Um, and then uh, he... This guy right here, the lanky Cameron, was, uh, he was a guitarist in the same local band, but I wasn't really interested in him, he wasn't very good. <laughs> but uh, James managed to convince me to get me in the band, and I still don't think he's very good, but you know. <laughs> and then um, shortly after, Sam joined, because he was in a band with uh, Danny before. Okay, cool. <coughs> Which was pretty shit. It is worth 
worth mentioning, however, that originally this new band actually had a synth member at first, uh, a guy named Ryan Binns. Um, so they were a six-piece, and their original bass player was a guy named Joe Lancaster, but for whatever reason it didn't work out with either of those guys, and uh, they both left the lineup fairly early on. They never got a replacement synth player, they just kept it as a five-piece and started having Danny write and record the synths on the recordings, and then they would just backtrack them live. Joe Lancaster, the original bass player, was, however, replaced by Sam Betley on bass. So, they've now got a ripping demo, the final episode. They've now gotten a full band recruited. Now they just needed a band name. Once again, legend has it that Ben kind of literally just didn't want to be bothered with the burden of coming up with a new band name, which I do understand. Picking a band name is incredibly difficult. If you've ever ha been in a band and you've had to come up with a band name, you know that it's, it's like so impossible. <laughs> it's so difficult. Um, so he just decided to carry on the name Asking Alexandria and name the new band Asking Alexandria also. It was fine because no one outside of Dubai or like the United Arab Emirates even knew who the OG Asking Alexandria were. Although it did end up causing some confusion later on with the two different bands having the same name, uh, but little did everyone know at the time that the new Asking Alexandria was about to create such a big impact that it really didn't matter. <laughs> and uh, the name, meaning behind it, uh, it doesn't really have much of a significant name. I mean, the kind of when we were thinking about it, uh, everyone, at, everyone's heard of Alexander the Great, <coughs> and at one point or another, he sort of dominated the world. Uh, everyone knew who he was, he traveled everywhere. Um, and that's kind of the same thing we're going for. We just want everyone to know who we are. Domination. places, <laughs> dominate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we just want well, to be able to take over everywhere. And I quite fancy riding an elephant. Yeah. Is that what he, is that what he did? He rode an elephant? He rode, yeah. We want kingdoms, please. Yeah. <laughs> so. Lots of money. Yeah, we just want to go as far as we can possibly go, really. So Travel and see that's the world. It's basically the same idea. And yeah. Alexandria is the female equivalent of Alexander, which just seems sort of softer and more gentle. Nicer name. Which is, yeah. Very nice. The band then recorded a series of other demos, still just recorded on a MacBook. I believe they programmed drums on these, maybe, is kind of what it sounds like, uh, because the band weren't able to hit a proper studio yet. But in the latter half of 2008, when the new Asking Alexandria was still getting started up in England, they laid down demos for songs like A Single Moment of Sincerity. A candlelit dinner with Anna Morta. This is another baby to believe a word I say. Nobody don't dance no more. Watch yourself and take it over. I was once possibly maybe perhaps a cowboy king. And the classic, not the American average. And considering the old Asking Alexandria from Dubai already had a MySpace page registered under the name Asking Alexandria with a bunch of fans already added on there, the new AA got a head start with online promotion by simply just basically nicking the old MySpace page and using it, putting their new music on there and their new lineup on there, gaining all the old fans of the original AA from the jump. All right, so let's just for fun take a look at the earliest logged screen grabs of the old Asking Alexandria MySpace page, the earliest logs that I could find on the Wayback Machine, shall we? This was in September of 2008. Uh, once again, we have this lovely, lovely MySpace layout, very cool. Um, it appears, however, that at this point the band was still kind of transitioning from the old AA into the new one because it still had the old bio uh, from the old Asking Alexandria on there, the one that I I just read, and their music player still had all of the old Asking Alexandria jams on it, but under members, we can clearly see it has the new lineup, Danny on vocals, Ben on guitar, Cameron Little on guitar, Joe Lancaster on bass, and James Cassells on drums. Um, I used to, <laughs> I, I love those on those old MySpace pages, how it always has, like, the lineup, and it's each guy's name, and, like, James, I don't know. I, but we need to bring that back, man. I don't know where or how, but we need to bring that back. 
back. Truly iconic. Um, and the title of their MySpace page did state Asking Alexandria Recording, presumably meaning that they were recording those new demos that I just showed you at that time. Um, but as you can see, this MySpace page already had 16,425 friends added to it. So like I said, head start. And while this very same MySpace screen grab from September of 2008 listed their location as United Kingdom slash United Arab Emirates, if you look down at their upcoming shows section, the only show listed was for a gig in Morris, Illinois at Sonic Portrait, which also stated that this will be their first U.S. show. Listen here, my friends. I gotta say it again. I, I might have been wrong earlier because this is where the story really gets interesting um, and when it really begins. Um, now, remember how I said that Ben Bruce was willing to take this band seriously and was pretty dead set on the dream. No, 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 not the dream, the goal of making it in a successful band. Well, guess what? Asking Alexandria's next move showed that Ben really, really, really wasn't fucking around. Somehow, Legend has it that around September of 2008, when this MySpace screen grab that I just showed you was from, Ben had somehow convinced Danny and James and Cameron and the other Asking Alexandria band members to pack up and move from England all the way across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States of America because, obviously, their chances of making it in music would be way more achievable in America. It was more achievable in England than it was in Dubai, and now he's realizing it's way more achievable in America than the UK. The idea was, you know, sure, they could start their band in England and play local shows around there and then try to get big in England, but... If you get big in England, you're kind of only big in England. You have to start over. It's like You, Me at Six is a perfect example of a band who got huge in England, uh, but then by the time they went to America, they basically had to start all over again because no one really knew them there. In America, if you get big there, pretty much just on default, you will get bigger in other countries and everywhere else too because, you know, America is just, that's just kind of how it is. And there was also just way more of a flourishing heavy metalcore music scene in the States. That music was way more popular in the States and their chances of blowing up in the music scene at large was ultimately way more achievable in America. So Ben was absolutely onto something with this idea and he made a very, very, very smart move by moving himself and the rest of AA to the States um, in order to start their band and get big. We haven't wow. been touring though. Like I said, we sat down and we really came up with a game plan and we mm -hmm. figured America was the biggest market we wanted to hit. The UK is, we love the UK, we really, really want to get big in the UK, um, but America's the biggest market that we're going to appeal to, so we came here first in the hopes that if we got bigger here, it would follow in the UK anyway. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we moved here. But here's the thing, while it was a smart move, it was also an extremely daring and ballsy and risky move too. I mean, c come on, uh, let's just let's just get into the specifics of this real quick. I I kind of don't understand, like I can't really conceptualize how this all realistically went down logistically for them. You see, Asking Alexandria at the time were literal nobodies. I mean, besides a few people in England or whatever, you know, amount of fans knew them from Dubai, which in the grand scheme of things at that time wasn't a whole lot of fans compared to other huge up-and-coming metalcore bands at the time. Uh, no one really knew who Asking Alexandria was at that point. They didn't have a lot of buzz. They didn't have any buzz. They weren't in talks with any labels. The only thing that they did have was a relationship with producer Joey Sturgis, who they got to know via the internet, who he had recorded albums for The Devil Wears Prada and Attack Attack uh, at the time, who were uh, bands that Asking Alexandria loved and were influenced by, and eventually he became like the go-to guy for metalcore around 2010. Every me huge metalcore band recorded with him, of Mice and Men, um, pretty much any band you could think of from around that time. In 2008, he was already becoming a very hot producer in the metalcore world, and he had agreed that he would help Asking Alexandria record their music, but besides their relationship with Joey, to put it bluntly, they 
really didn't have shit, <laughs> is what I'm saying. And I guess what I don't entirely understand is how it really worked financially. Just to put it into perspective, Asking Alexandria didn't really start making actual money from their music until about 2010 or so, and as the story goes, Asking Alexandria lived in a bandwagon, which is like a little RV type thing, outside of a Walmart parking lot in New Jersey, broke and sharing ramen noodles and roughing it out. That was their life, their existence for their first year in the States. It's pretty respectable. It's very ambitious and very respectable, but moving to a different country costs money. Living costs money. Eating, they liked to drink and smoke during this time. Alcohol costs money. Cigarettes cost money. Gas costs money. Musical gear costs money. Recording with Joey Sturgis costs money. If they spent their first year and a half in America without any making any real money from their music, how exactly did they support themselves during this time and make it all happen? I don't get it. They've never mentioned anything uh, about them working jobs or anything during this time. In fact, I'm pretty sure Ben has actually said in interviews that he's never worked a real job before, ever. So they definitely weren't working at like Jimmy John's or anything. <laughs> I don't know, maybe they like saved up a lot of money, maybe their parents were just helping them out. Did one of them have like a trust fund or something? I don't think so, but I mean that's, I don't think of, I, I don't know what else could explain that. You know, did they secretly come from tons of money? I honestly would not be surprised because I don't know realistically how five dudes, plus probably some of their like crew members pull this off especially like I said considering they weren't making any money didn't have a fan base didn't have a record deal whatever they just kind of moved to America on a whim with nothing but a dream it's crazy really like I said I can't really wrap my head around how exactly they made that work logistically but that's the story they've always told uh, you know and they made it happen and like I said regardless it's very daring and ballsy and respectable and and like ultimately like a really cool story and by the fall of 2008 Asking Alexandria were officially living in America in New Jersey, like I said, in a bandwagon in a Walmart parking lot, writing for their full-length album, which they were planning to record with Joey Sturgis. Wild. We're in Hicksville, in yeah. Indiana. Oh it's a nice place if you like caravans. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I think everyone at the minute is living in a caravan here. And James is scared of dogs and running around, and they're coming back now. We're at Joey Sturgis' studio, and they're coming back in. How was it? They can't get into Joey's studio. Bad. Uh-huh. Pretty bad. Oh. What's your opinion on Hicksville, right? Clear. Clear. <laughs> so yeah, we're going to start recording in a little bit. What do you think about Hicksville, Indiana? I feel it annoys. Cam, what do you think about Hicksville? Um, wow, I'm, I'm slightly think. scared, to be honest. Drums are finished. Um, no, I'm fucked. He's fucked. Obviously, since they were still starting the band, it was around this time, uh, now that they were in America, it was, you know, in Asking Alexandria's best interest to start playing some shows in the States and actually start building up a real following. And that's exactly what they did. They started playing all these local shows, you know, pretty much anything they could find around New Jersey or New York or, you know, Pennsylvania. Um, you know, they were East Coast based at the time. So they were playing all these little VFW halls on the East Coast to, like nobody.
rough around the edges at first, as any band is, but hey, they were five young men all alone and broke in a different country than they grew up in, doing whatever they could to try and make their fucking thing happen. It was respectable, man. However, the real factor that helped Ask Me Alexandria begin to really massively blow up around this time like most bands who came out of the MySpace era, was internet success. The band stayed very savvy online, getting their music out there to anyone who would listen, and pretty quickly little RAR XD metalcore scene kids across the world were starting to take notice. The band were definitely in the right place, doing the right thing at the right time. I mean, their rough around the edges yet expertly crafted demos, which the band had at the time, showed insane amounts of potential. And Asking Alexandria were starting to look like the perfect band to ride the coattails of the success of other metalcore acts who were already blowing up and huge at around that point, like Bring Me the Horizon or The Devil Wears Prada or, of course, Attack Attack. The quality of Asking Alexandria's demos at the time showed people that. AA were a band to watch, a band who right off the bat were taking influence and inspiration from all these other bands who were popular at the time, refining it, and, you know, taking it to new places musically, and, you know, they had the capability to possibly bring it to even bigger heights than some of the bands who preceded Asking Alexandria. You know, I, I think that's what a lot of people were seeing in these demos at the time. They were really good. And the internet really started taking notice. I mean, while Asking Alexandria were playing shitty VFW halls and buttfuck New Jersey to like 25 people, they quickly hit 1 million song plays on their MySpace page and then two months later hit 2 million song plays, and by May of 2009, they had officially inked a deal with Sumerian Records, a label which was at the time known for having a roster full of some pretty heavy and pretty legitimate bands like After the Burial, Stray from the Path, Veil of Maya, Sea of Treachery, and A Graceful, just to name a few. And following the very exciting news of them signing to a real legit record label and getting super hype with millions of plays online, in May and June of 2009, the band then went into the studio with metalcore superstar producer Joey Sturgis in Connorsville, Indiana, and began recording their debut full-length record. Morning, Danny. Morning. How's it hanging? It's hanging a bit high up. <laughs> oh, what are you playing? Unreal Tournament. Unreal Tournament. Yeah. I'm finding a star near you. Hey, mate. What's up? How's it going? Yeah, not too bad. What's been going on? <sighs> Trying to fix the Jeep. Me and Ben went to go and walk down there. Yeah. Asked this random guy if he had any antifreeze, but he didn't, but he's come to help us anyway. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> Mr. Cameron Little, that is my bum hole, and, and that is for me and me and my hand. And me. <laughs> and me. This is what he's been living off for 12 hours. Keep it alive. She's not as hot as she used to be, but her tits look bigger. <laughs> Asking Alexandria, we're gonna pull a whole RV. <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> oh yeah! Easy! What? <laughs> oh, One finger. This is good. I can do this shit.
Alright, so now, once the recording process for their full length had been completed, now, with the help of real record label support, as well as insane amounts of online buzz, the band hit the ground running, touring the country on real tours, finally cutting their teeth, having the time of their lives, and hoping to God that their upcoming debut album that they just recorded was gonna do somewhat well so that they could continue touring and continue being an American and trying to make their dreams happen. The first tour that the band embarked on was called the Blaze of Glory Tour in June and July of 09, with a static lullaby and Vanna co-headlining, it looks like, asking Alexandria right before them, as well as Motionless and White and Tides of Man opening. Uh, interesting and kind of funny how asking were already billed above Motionless and White and Tides of Man when this was only their first ever real tour. I can only presume that that's because of the insane insane amount of online hype which the band were already receiving at the time. Right after their tour with the Static Lullaby, the band spent September on tour opening up for All Asana uh, with fellow openers The Bled, Enter Shikari, and Broadway. That's a cool tour. It was during this tour, the band's second ever real tour, where the band finally released their debut full-length record, their first official release, I might add. They didn't have any EPs or, or anything before that. Just just the demos on MySpace, but they finally got their first full-length record out called Stand Up and Scream, which came out on September 15th of 2009, produced by Joey Sturgis and released through Sumerian Records. <laughs> guys stand up and scream all right holy shit man what a record what can i say about stand up and scream that hasn't already been said before you know it's revered at this point it's a classic if you're a scene kid in any way shape or form that is around you know their 20s at this point you've heard stand up and scream like, you know this record, you know? I, I I don't know very many people who haven't heard this record and don't love it. Um, now, before we get into the music on this thing, as well as its eventual general impact on the Warped Tour metalcore scene at large, I do want to point out that when this record was released, it first charted at number 170 on the Billboard 200, number 29 on the Top Independent Albums chart, as well as number 4 on the Top Heat Seekers chart. Now, these are actually some pretty insane numbers for a band's debut release, uh, especially a band who had only really just begun touring in the States and had no official releases before. I mean, 170 on the charts might seem kind of low, especially, you know, considering where Asking Alexandria are now, but debut albums by new bands don't usually even make any charts at all. I mean, to put this into perspective, uh, let's look at Fall Out Boy's debut album, Take This to Your Grave, shall we? That album failed to chart when it was put out. It didn't make it onto any charts until about a year after they had put it out and were touring on it. So if you look at their careers in a uh, chronological uh, perspective, Asking Alexandria were like uh, technically beating Fall Out Boy in terms of how fast they were blowing up at that point in their career, <laughs> which is pretty crazy. <laughs> Now, let me 
tell you, I don't even have to tell you, you know, but I'm going to say it anyway. Musically speaking, this record is absolutely fucking juiced, man. It's totally revved up. It's 13 tracks of sheer hype all the way through. There's not a bad song on here. Come to think of it, there's not really a boring moment at all on this album, period. They didn't just make like a regular, average, decent enough metalcore album that was just good enough to, you know, get them on some tours and get them an average amount of buzz. No, they were breaking barriers with these songs, man. Breaking new ground left and right. They just made an, a whole album of all-around hype-ass songs which were energetic, gut-punching, heavy, creative, and very finely crafted and memorable. That being said, though, I do have to say they weren't exactly inventing the wheel here on this album. I mean, they basically took a lot of the sounds and styles that were already laid down and popularized by other metalcore bands at the time. If you listen to, like, the first Bring Me the Horizon album, you know, or the first Attack Attack album, you can tell that Asking Alexandria sat down and listened to those records and said, let's do this, but do it our own way. And what doing it their own way meant was basically kind of like I've been saying, refining it, simplifying it, but also beefing it up in certain aspects and ultimately just pushing the metalcore sound and style at the time to new places and higher heights that hadn't really been explored before. Uh, you know, just to get into it, the record starts off with Alarion, which is definitely one of the most iconic late 2000s metalcore intro songs, possibly the, the most iconic, right up there with Attack Attack's Hot Grills and High Tops, except a Alarion might even be a little bit more legit than that one because Alarion isn't just a joke like crunk hip hop intro. DJ Club! Nah, man, Alarion, the synths come in, there's like sounds of thunder going on and shit, there's like a British girl talking on the phone. It's all intense and really just setting the stage for bombs to start going off, man. You know, you hear the first part of the song, it sounds like some shit's about to go down. Uh, and then the band comes in and lays down their signature, simple, yet punchy and in your face, dry. Drop D open chugging while James Cassells lays down his perfectly played and expertly crafted machine-like intricate metalcore drumming behind it. Quick side note, James's drumming is seriously impressive and is a huge highlight on this album and is definitely a highlight of Asking Alexandria in general. This dude was insane behind the kit and uh, really carried the band musically in a lot of ways and, you know, his work should not go unnoticed. <laughs> Anyways, back to Alarion. Uh, the song breaks and a huge gang vocal chant of the whole band yelling, FUCK THIS! happens, uh, a phrase which a young Danny Warsnop infamously got tattooed across his knuckles at the time. Next, Danny's crisp, powerful, urgent, demon-like screams come bursting through the fucking door, killing everything in sight and really bodying any challenger stupid enough to stand in asking Alexandria's path of dominating the world with their catchy, down-tuned metalcore. All of Danny's vocals were absolutely fucking legit on this album. I mean, the dude sounded badass. He was rough around the edges in their demos, but he took it up a notch on this album. He sounded like a boss. He sounded like a professional. You know, and with that, with this song Alarion, we're off to the races. Like I said, the band was absolutely full of youthful energy, rage, and just the utmost of all piss and vinegar on these songs throughout this entire album. The final episode then comes in next, which was the first single on this album, and, you know, this song, my god, the combination of the fast-paced, aggressive chugging, the big, oh my god, gang chants throughout the song, the, you know, there's really cool, um, Whenever they do gang vocals on this album, you can hear their British accents really well. And <laughs> it's like one of my favorite parts about it for some reason. There's one in the final episode where they're like, Honey, it's just the start of this. Honey, it's just the start of it. It's like, it's just awesome, man. It's so fun. You know, that happens throughout the song. There's an infectious, intense chorus and, uh, you know, all around gut punching energy throughout this entire song, accompanied by that simple yet iconic music video where the band is performing in the dark and all those like cups of tea are shaking and falling off of desks and whatever caused this song to be asking Alexandria's first real hit within the scene. Uh, and this was the song that really first put the band on 
the map. This song just exploded at the time. The final episode was a lot of people's first taste of Asking Alexandria, and it's still like one of the first songs that comes into people's heads when you think about Asking Alexandria. Um, it's a truly anthemic scene classic at this point. A Candlelit Dinner Within Immorta comes next, which the band rarely plays this song live. It's definitely a very like scene sounding track in line with bands like Alisana and you know stuff like that that was coming around the time. It is a huge fan favorite off this album and it kind of shows the more emo side of the band with some really heartfelt lyrics but don't get it twisted this song doesn't let up on the sheer intensity throughout it. There's some really cool synth stuff on this song and a really awesome like all-out electronica section around the bridge with more of the uh <laughs> British accent gang vocals going on. Uh, seriously awesome, creative, and memorable stuff. That bridge with the gang vocals that I was talking about is definitely one of my favorite moments on this record. The rest of the first half of the record, if you will, uh, shows off the band's slightly more technical metalcore side of things on tracks like the Swagger Fields, Nobody Don't Dance No More, uh, and then the track Hey There Mr. Brooks, which that song might just be the heaviest track on this whole album. Next on the album comes a uh, electronic interlude type track called Hiatus, um, which is a track similar to things that bands like Attack Attack or I Set My Friends on Fire were also doing on their albums, or pretty much literally every metalcore band from around this time uh, were all doing. They all had these electronic dance interludes on their album. I don't know why it was a huge trend at the time. Everyone was doing them. Even Chiodos had them. Although, one interesting thing uh, and one unique thing musically about uh, Stand Up and Scream, one thing that any of the members of Asking Alexandria would be eager to tell you around this time is that they took their electronic influences for this album from like Euro dance music and European trance music and that kind of thing, which was very uh, a unique aspect of this album considering all the other metalcore bands at the time were pretty much just taking influence from like American pop and American electro stuff for their electronic sections and influence. Um, so that is a cool thing about this album, although most kids listening probably wouldn't even notice. <laughs> so after this hiatus interlude track is arguably where shit really starts to get going on this album. If you didn't think this album was crazy enough already, this is, this is where they really give you some one-two punches of crazy extreme classic, iconic, awesome 2009 metalcore. They hit us with a triple whammy, three insanely huge, groundbreaking, and now looked back on as classic, iconic songs right in a row, all after this uh, hiatus interlude track. The first of which being the song If You Can't Ride Two Horses, You Should Get Out of the Circus, a super amped up metalcore track with some great, powerful, and memorable vocals from Danny on this thing, as well as some really creative and standout instrumental parts on the song, which I'm pretty sure, you know, the ending part of the song is really insane, and uh, I'm pretty sure Joey Sturgis crafted all of that, so <laughs> uh, this song really shows, uh, you know, where Joey's influence on this album, you know, really came into play versus their demos, you know? Then after that, we got the song A Single Moment of Sincerity, another classic, iconic asking track. This song is definitely one of my favorites on this whole album and another fan favorite, very iconic song. The track Not the American Average comes barreling through the door next, a great song and a very important song on this album for a few different reasons. Uh, this song, much like the final episode, soon became one of Asking Alexandria's biggest songs, and you could definitely call this song somewhat of a smash hit, at least within the Warp Tour scene. Uh, it's still to this day up there in Asking's top five most played songs on Spotify, which is pretty cool. I don't know if they're embarrassed about that, but obviously the song is still beloved. Now, one very, very notable thing about this song was that this was the first song that they ever wrote, um, which had a bit of an 80s hair metal slash kind of glam rock influence to it, both in the instrumentals at the beginning, as well as really primarily Danny's vocals on this song. So as Asking Alexandria grew as a band on their later albums, uh, which obviously we will get into, it became no secret that vocalist Danny Warsnop was a huge, huge, huge 80s rock and roll fan, uh, even way more so than any sort of metalcore or screamo type stuff. His favorite bands were Motley Crue and Aerosmith and Bon Jovi and all that sort of stuff. 
stuff, which is kind of weird uh, for a vocalist of a metalcore band to primarily be into that kind of stuff. Like I said, we're going to get into all this uh, in the future. Uh, but because of that, on their next few albums, Asking definitely began evolving into more of a classic rock type sound, sort of mixed with metalcore, um, which definitely caused a lot of criticisms within their fan base. Some people loved it, some people hated it. It, it was it became a lot different from what they were doing on this album. And and like I said, trust me, we're going to get into all of that um, in the next videos. But Not the American Average was the first time that Danny Warsnop's love of 80s hair metal shone through in an Asking Alexandria track as a direct influence. So, you know, that obviously makes this song a very standout one on this album and kind of a hint of where things were going to be going for the band in the future. A little bit. This song also just slaps so hard, not the American average. It's a total classic at this point. It's like eight completely different awesome songs in one. I don't even know how they pulled it off. There's so many different parts in this song, but they all somehow go together. Like I said, this song has always been a huge standout and a fan favorite off this album, and like I said, a scene hit. If you know this album, you know just how epic these songs are, and I don't know, Asking Alexandria really just were good at making the most epic, juiced up metalcore that they possibly could on this album, uh, and made songs that really make you feel like a fucking badass when you're listening to them. You know, I touch my glasses because it makes you feel like you're wearing fucking aviator sunglasses and you're wearing a leather jacket like they just make you feel badass you know and they made hits like i said these were some real metalcore hits they weren't mainstream hits but like everyone within the scene knew these songs all of my friends at the time like my 14 year old little scene homies the, you know this album was like you had to know this album at the time it was huge these songs became staples within the scene real quick everyone's facebook profile photo caption was i was meant to make you smile i was meant to make you shine you know what i mean this shit got huge and people were people were really addicted also i feel like it's very worth mentioning that asking alexandria were pretty much the kings of the pre-breakdown gang vocal chant or the mosh call one-liner whatever you want to call it they are absolutely riddled throughout this whole record and asking alexandria pretty much made big pre-breakdown gang vocal chants a signature staple of their sound on this record whether it be oh my god <laughs> or get on your knees or 10 inch uh they were everywhere and yes well a lot of well, really almost all of them were pretty crude and immature and vaguely misogynistic. Uh, it really worked at the time and appealed to the young, edgy audience uh, that they had, uh, which the band was connecting itself to at the time. It was also a really good marketing strategy, too. I mean, the band basically had these, like, phrases that they were known for, aside from just songs or what have you, which uh, of course you know that they plastered those silly, weird, sexual gang chants in huge impact font letters all over their t-shirts and whatnot, which you better believe they sold a shit ton of. Uh, I just wonder how many little RAR XD scene kids were sent home from 8th grade so, you know, because they had to change out of their you stupid fucking whore asking Alexander a shirt into something a little bit more classroom appropriate. The lyrics, you know, regardless of the crudeness or the vague misogyny, the lyrics on this album are definitely just perfect 14-year-old uh, teen angst lyrics. They were iconic. I knew when I first saw you, you'd fuck like a whore. Uh, that big I was meant to make you smile section will trick you under the fucking table. I mean, these songs were undeniable, man. It was goofy, but it, it was a fun ass time. <laughs> Plus, uh, you know, vocalist Danny Warsnot being literally 18 years old when he recorded this album helped it achieve the highest level of pure teen angst in the most genuinely real and palpable way. Oh, also, between all of the juiced up, down-tuned breakdowns and throat-shredding screams, there's a few soft string piano sections uh, on this album where guitarist Ben Bruce actually takes over the lead vocals on parts. There's a part in A Single Moment of Sincerity and also a part in Not the American Average. There might be a couple more, but I think that's it, where Ben Bruce sings. And these Ben Bruce sections are, like, surprisingly really beautiful and, like, 
moving and heartfelt <laughs> sounding, like genuinely well done. <laughs> shows that the band really were like talented musicians and weren't simply just electronic or breakdown machines like underneath all of those breakdowns and gang chants and everything there was some real talent in this band and they had some real songwriting chops obviously Joey Sturgis might have also had something to do with that but it was there anyways back to the track list on this album uh, this album then brings us the fast paced and in my opinion super underrated I used to have a best friend but then he gave me an STD more of the band's, you know, uh, crude, immature, Blink-182-esque humor in there, um, in the song title. Uh, it, <laughs> it goes through that song before sailing through three more all-killer, no-filler, absolutely iconic metalcore classics. Another emo tinge track, A Prophecy, which was another big hit off this album. It had a music video. It's become a live staple for them. Great song. Then into one of the most infectious and creative songs on this album. Definitely one of the catchiest metalcore songs I've ever heard in my life. Uh, certain parts from the song get stuck in my head constantly. The song being I Was Once Possibly Maybe Perhaps A Cowboy King, another iconic song. And then right into the raucous ode to getting drunk and partying uh, when every day's the weekend, which closes out the album and is honestly the perfect closer on this thing. To put it simply, Asking Alexandria made a fucking amazing debut record. I mean, this record has it all. Like I said, they really pushed the boundaries uh, musically on this album with great success. They were great at crafting these infectious metalcore tracks, and they were hungry as fuck for it. And you can you can like feel their hunger for wanting the top spot in the scene on this record. It, you know, it was energetic in your face. They fucking wanted it. They were serious. Like I said earlier, Ben Bruce wasn't fucking around, and you can even tell just by these songs. You know, like I was mentioning earlier, they were young and full of piss and vinegar and put everything they had into making the best, most standout debut record that they possibly could, knowing that making their dreams come true relied on making this record a smash in the increasingly oversaturated Warped Tour heavy music scene. Um, you know, that scene was really exploding at this time, and Asking Alexandria knew that they needed to make a great record, and I think, and we're going to get into all this, but I think that they really helped push the metalcore genre and that musical style to new heights of popularity and exposure with this record. And it really fucking worked! I mean, by the time that they were releasing Stand Up and Scream in September of 09, Asking Alexandria as a band really were like the total package at the time, beyond even just how great the songs were. I mean, they all had the look, they all totally looked the part, they were absolutely hilarious dudes. I mean, every interview the band did was an absolute riot. We're gonna get more into that. Uh, but Ben Bruce is like one of the funniest Warp Tour band dudes of all time, if you ask me. That dude is just so funny. How many girls do you guys go through on tour? At least 55 a night. Yeah, because right, like we have a saying in our band, we like to collect as many STDs as possible. It's like Pokemon, we trade them all with our friends and stuff. So gotta catch them all. Dude, that's pretty gotta catch sweet. them all, man. Why not, right? Mm. So the more money we have, the more boots we can buy, the more strippers we can buy, the more STDs we can trade with people, you know what I'm That's saying? That's probably the best. <laughs> Help us spread the love. <laughs> they obviously made a fantastic boundary-pushing standout debut record, and not to mention, this band got really fucking good live around this time, too. Like I said, they were rough around the edges when they started, but once Stand Up and Scream came out, they really, really worked on their live show to the point where they really were one of the most attention-grabbing, attitude-ridden, charismatic live bands, uh, with one of the most fun live shows to watch in the whole metalcore scene at the time. <laughs> Fuck! Oh. 
arrived at this time. Danny was so energetic and so juiced. That's another thing we're going to get into in like the part two video is his... And in certain ways, a lot of their live performances became kind of lackluster as the years went on due to all of the drugs and alcohol uh, that they were putting into their systems. But at this time, they were young and, and, you know, they were just absolutely murdering it live. A lot of these videos of them playing live from the Stand Up and Scream album cycle, I still watch all the time just for fun, just because they were so good and so iconic and so tight and Danny was just killing it. All right, now, although I swear by Stand Up and Scream and Rar XD scene kids all over the world were insanely amped and obsessed with this record at the time, and it's now looked back on as a truly iconic metalcore classic. It would be silly of me not to bring up the simple fact that this record and this band in general also got an onslaught of hate and animosity at the time, usually from the typical older jaded scene gatekeepers and also just the kind of neckbeard metal crowd, you know, the, the people who go on, like, Metal Injection and Lamb Goat and sites like that, the real metal people, all hated and berated Asking Alexandria for a variety of reasons at the time. Now this rants on a shit fucking band known as Asking Alexandria. That's not metal. For starters, Asking Alexandria guitar parts are very simple. As a band, uh, they are a lot more focused on presenting classic styles of metalcore in the form of pop song structure or arena rock song structure, which in turn causes Asking Alexandria's riffs and their breakdowns to ultimately be pretty simple and digestible and easy to play compared to other more technical bands at the time, um, uh, to a point where Asking Alexandria does often get a little predictable uh, on this album. Um, in a, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just, you know, they, they had simple parts. In a genre where most bands, like, goodness level is especially at the time, was usually determined by how difficult or technical or crazy the riffs are, Asking Alexandria understandably got a lot of hate from fans in the metal world who would back in the day, and currently still probably, uh, just constantly rip on the band for playing really simple, uncomplicated, open breakdowns all the time and being quote-unquote generic, which, you know, is what it is, but at the end of the day, the simplicity of the riffs in their music was in a lot of ways, part of what made their music so catchy and what made them get so much bigger than all of the other metalcore bands at the time and what made them attract such a large and young audience which covered many different demographics more so than your average you know metal technical metalcore band at the time would and this is because asking alexandria were not <laughs> trying to impress a bunch of 30 year old metal neckbeards by you know uh, how complicated their riffs were like a lot of other bands were at the time asking alexandria were way more focused on songwriting, uh, writing catchy riffs and breakdowns which were easily digestible for the listener get stuck in your head and make you want to listen to the song over and over and over again, as opposed to just a bunch of crazy breakdowns and technical parts in a row which don't really make sense unless you already listen to and like a lot of metalcore. You know what I mean? Think of it this way. A record like, say, I don't know, Hot Damn by Every Time I Die, right? Total classic, total classic in the metalcore world. Great record. I love that record. Every Time I Die are one of my favorite bands. But that is the kind of record where I feel like you kind of need to listen to it like several times first before you really get it. It might not make sense on first or second listen, but once you listen to it several times, you realize how great it is and then you fall in love with it. Assuming you are, though, already a person who appreciates heavy music and more specifically metalcore. Stand Up and Scream by Asking Alexandria, however, you could listen to this thing no matter what kind of music you already listen to. You could just be into pop punk or, or whatever, and you can listen to this thing once or twice all the way through and already have, like, the choruses memorized and even a lot of the breakdowns, too. Regardless of what kind of music you listen to, it's arguably uh, about pretty much just as widely accessible as a metalcore band could be at the time. It's kind 
kind of a lot like what A Day to Remember had done a couple years prior to AA hitting the scene uh, on their earlier albums like For Those Who Have Heart and Homesick, where they basically took influences from both the pop punk world and the metalcore genres, combined them, and wrote their songs using traditional pop song structures and very catchy melody and breakdowns, making an often very unaccessible and niche genre like metalcore used to be, and presented it in a way which can be easily digestible to mass audiences. And it worked. A Day to Remember got huge and were one of the biggest bands of that era and are still really big. Asking Alexandria are essentially doing the same thing on this record, but instead of uh, doing what A Day to Remember did and making a combination of pop punk and metalcore, Asking Alexandria were just doing a version of straight up metalcore, uh, however, way more accessible to audiences far and wide than all those more esoteric, more polarizing metalcore bands who only really appealed to people who were already into metalcore. You know what I'm saying? Basically what I'm saying was Asking Alexandria were a gateway band, an entry point for kids who had never really gotten into metalcore before to start with, before eventually getting into other more esoteric acts like Every Time I Die or or whatever. That's why their fan base was so young, that's a big reason why they got so big too, and that's why they received a lot of hate from the real metal crowd, because they were like, fuck this poser shit, whatever, but at the end of the day, Asking Alexandria were really just setting themselves up to be like, like I said, a gateway band, which is the kind of thing where that always happens in any genre, like someone would have done it, you know what I mean? Asking Alexandria just happened to be the ones to do it, you know, to, to be that kind of, like, the simplest form of this kind of music, to reach it to a bigger audience and get more people into it. I don't know why so many people hate on that kind of thing. I, you know, it's, it's getting more people into the genre of music. Why wouldn't you want that to happen? I don't know. Um, that's a whole other can of beans. So this all kind of ties into the fact that, um, you know, if you remember uh, the bands I was talking about that Asking Alexandria were super influenced by when they were starting out, like Parkway Drive or The Devil Wears Prada, Attack Attack, and Bring the Horizon, that sort of thing. Off of this record, Stand Up and Scream, Asking Alexandria actually ended up getting like way bigger than most of those bands, except for maybe Bring Me the Horizon, but they ended up surpassing a lot of those bands, all Asana, all that type of stuff, in popularity pretty quickly. Um, and I think there's, you know, these, uh, there's a lot of reasons behind that. For example, Stand Up and Scream is a lot catchier and more melodic than The Devil Wears Prada or Bring Me the Horizon. Um, and although they were often compared to Attack Attack quite a bit, and often hated on by metalcore purists just as much as them, Attack Attack came first, you know, their record came out about a year before uh, Stand Up and Scream, and, you know, Attack Attack were a, a lot goofier looking than Asking Alexandria. Well, I don't know if they were a lot goofier looking, but they were definitely more goofier looking. Um, ca <laughs> causing Attack Attack to catch the majority of the brunt of the hate from people who really just weren't having it with the catchy synth neon metalcore crabcore thing. And Attack Attack were often lumped in with even more polarizing acts at the time, such as Broken Side or Blood on the Dance Floor, which Asking Alexandria weren't. I remember back in the day a lot of people referring to Stand Up and Scream as kind of a heavier version of Attack Attack, aka a slightly less raw XD cringe version of Attack Attack, which allowed Asking Alexandria to be viewed as a slightly more credible and less polarizing slash novelty thing as Attack Attack were, which again allowed them to have uh, even further success and further grow their audience and evolve their music into more of a hard arena rock direction later on and just keep getting bigger. Uh, but obviously we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Either way, Stand Up and Scream ended up becoming a massive, gigantic album in the metalcore scene, and 2010 really ended up being Asking Alexandria's year. They toured their asses off, and they got a little bit bigger each tour they did, actually a lot a bit bigger each tour they did, and by the summer of 2010, Asking Alexandria were officially a headlining act, uh, and were also at the point that they were essentially a household name within the burgeoning Warped Tour metalcore scene, becoming as big as scene frontrunners like Attack Attack and the Devil Wars Prada and Mice and Men. They really rose to the top of the chain very quickly.
quickly. Just to uh, go through their touring history during this time, just to get a good perspective on their actual rise to the top and what it looked like. After Stand Up and Scream was released in September of 09, the band spent October and November of 2009 on the road opening up for Evergreen Terrace and For the Fallen Dreams on the Almost Homeless Tour. Next, the band went back out opening for Alisana again. Alisana, I think it's actually called. People always correct me in the comments. I've been saying for the last like 14 years, Alisana. But I, people tell me it's Alisana. I don't think I'll ever stop saying Alisana, though, because I've been saying that for years. So, yeah, I know what it really is, but I'm going to keep saying all, all... Now I don't even know what the right one is. Whatever. Alis, Alisana. They, they opened for Alisana again. Alisana. See, Alisana, it sounds weird to me. I know it's technically right. I'm just going to say Alisana. I don't give a fuck. Um, they opened for Alisana again on the, get this... You'd be way cuter in a coffin tour <laughs> in December of 09 um, with fellow openers from first to last, The Word Alive and Memphis Mayfire. Next, the band started off 2010 doing some European tour dates opening for Dance Gavin Dance and In Fear and Faith uh, before heading back to the States for a tour in March and April of 2010 opening for fellow crab course stalwarts Attack Attack on the Artery Foundation Across the Nation tour with fellow openers Breathe Carolina. I See Stars and Barry Tomorrow. Now, although the band hadn't really been touring for all that long compared to a lot of other bands who usually have to grind it out for years before they gain any kind of hype or, you know, even become headliners, Asking Alexandria's hype at this point was so unbelievably off the chain and their debut record, Stand Up and Scream, was doing so well that, like I said, by May and June of 2010, they were on their first official proper headlining tour of the United States called the Welcome to the Circus Tour. The name being a reference to their song, If You Can't Ride Two Horses, You Should Get Out of the Circus. The openers on this tour included We Came as Romans, From First to Last, Our Last Night, and A Bullet for a Pretty Boy. Now, just to put it into perspective of how big Asking Alexandria had gotten so quickly uh, and what an impact they were making on the scene at the time, From First to Last were a band who obviously had been around for quite a bit of years uh, at that point and had influenced the scene that Asking Alexandria existed in quite a bit. Uh, and Ben Bruce has actually stated numerous times that he grew up listening to and loving From First to Last, uh, you know, and their Dear Diary album was always in his car on rotation when he was a kid. Uh, so even though, uh, yeah, there is an element of it that from first to last were definitely not nearly as popular or as hype once 2009 rolled around as they were in like 05 when, you know, young Sonny Moore was their vocalist. You know, this was after Sonny Moore left the band and became Skrillex. Uh, but uh, fact of the matter is, Asking Alexandria's Childhood Heroes, a band they grew up listening to and being influenced by from first to last, were now opening for them on their tour. If that's not fucking living <laughs> the, the rock and roll dream and accomplishing your goals, I don't know what is. So following their headliner, Asking Alexandria then went out co-headlining the 2010 Thrash and Burn tour at the end of the summer of 2010, a pretty big tour with a jam-packed lineup of some very heavy bands, uh, most of these bands being a lot heavier than Asking Alexandria, such as Born of Osiris, Impending Doom, Evergreen Terrace, Chelsea Grin, Periphery, Greeley Estates, etc, etc, etc. On these summer tours that the band went on, the band also started debuting a new song called Breathless at their shows, uh, telling the crowd that it was a song from their upcoming second record, which uh, they also were saying that they were starting to record at that point in time, or we're in the process of recording. Anyways, uh, we're getting to the end here, folks. I know this, I've been talking for a while about Stand Up and Scream era asking Alexandria, but they, 
I mean, it's important. They were really like the perfect metalcore band at around this time, if you ask me. And this era of the band now, looking back, the Stand Up and Scream era was really truly like important and kind of defining in the world of Warp Tour metalcore. And they were really ultimately just something truly special around this time. Uh, I definitely would say that this era of the band had a certain type of lightning in a bottle type magic to it, which eventually, as time went on, you know, the Asking Alexandria hype machine started to get so big and so crazy that it almost inevitably uh, started to implode in on itself, and the band really never ever felt as special and as amazing as it did during the Stand Up and Scream era. And sure, I mean, they definitely had their high points and low points throughout the years since then, and we're going to get into all of it, but the Stand Up and Scream era of this band was really truly something special. Asking Alexandria also just had something. They had the thing that separates a band from just being a group of like nameless, faceless guys who play some good songs and put on a decent live show. Um, the thing that separates that from a band who really connect and identify with people on a personal level, um, you know, everyone kind of knows exactly who's in the band and their personalities and, uh, you know, a band who really creates an image and a lifestyle which people attach themselves to. They were like like a lifestyle band as opposed to a just a song band. Does that make any sense? There was like a culture surrounding Asking Alexandria and their music and them as people, which is a very unique and special feat, which most bands just don't have the charisma to create. However, and this is kind of where we're going to leave this video off at, but uh, it would soon come to light that the band who always, since before they started, had an affinity for alcohol consumption and partying, uh, were, you know, at this point dealing with their newfound fame in some not so healthy self-destructive ways. Their party lifestyle, which there are several lyrics on the Stand Up and Scream album which refer to how much they liked to party, this lifestyle only became more amplified and pushed to its limits once Asking Alexandria got bigger and bigger and became a headlining act in summer of 2010, aka when they started making some dollar dollar bills and could afford, you know, their habits easier. They turned into a group of guys who were constantly drunk and would often be quite inebriated on stage, uh, and around this time they started to have an affinity for various other drugs, and although it was all fun and games at first, in the Stand Up and Scream era, it would be something that within the next few years would start to not only drag the band down on a personal level, but would also start to cause a whole slew of problems which almost killed the band, like, uh, almost killed, you know, the band's career, but almost literally killed certain members of the band. The band, who, like I said, were huge fans of 80s glam rock, uh, and became even bigger fans of that kind of stuff as time went on, saw their newfound fame and success, and basically started to take the lifestyle and the teachings of Motley Crue in the 80s to heart, and they were almost on a mission to party harder than any band that came before them, which within a few years started to seem like like more of a death wish than a battle cry. That's all for today, though. Um, we're going to get into all the crazy partying and problems that started to unravel for the band uh, and wild, insane incidents that this band took part in in the part two video, which will be coming as soon as I can possibly whip it up. Uh, but for now, Thank you all for watching so much. I've been your friendly neighborhood cozy representative, and this has been The Wild Rise of Asking Alexandria Part 1. Um, stay beautiful out there, friends. Stay away from drugs, and I will see you next time. Get stoked for Part 2. Peace out. Have a great day, y'all. Deeper question, but how would you guys define success as a band? And if, if you haven't reached it yet, or if you have... When did it hit you? I, I haven't reached the point where I feel like we've necessarily made it yet. This, yeah, we're still this, a tiny baby. This, pop, this music is so small. It's can I aspire to bring this music into being a big music? Because no band in this music 
in the grand scheme of things, who is anything? Because it's not, it's not put out commercially. No one knows this music is so underground. We're trying to bring that, like, do we can, a different, to a different. When we can make this music, bands that can play stadium tours and stuff, and just the, uh, then. The phrase is never again. That's the success of me. That's like what I feel like I've succeeded.